Hello, I'm Sarah Franklin. I'm really pleased to welcome you to this very special webinar today as part of the Alumni Festival 2020. Um, I know it's a bit different from previous alumni festivals, but hopefully even more of you are able to attend this year because we're online. Uh, so in this session today, we're gonna to be looking at the new research program at Cambridge on LGBTQ plus issues. And we're also gonna be looking at the related developments in the alumni network and the staff network um, amongst the student community and the colleges um, and across the university as a whole. Um, so I really wanna thank all of you for your interest in this area. And I have to say, um, as, as the chair of sociology and the director of LGBTQ program that the headline news is how much activity has been happening at Cambridge in this space, especially over the past couple of years. Um, I, I myself have been teaching in this area since I came to Cambridge and one of the things that really struck me is how much student interest there is in the area of LGBTQ. There's a huge amount of interest in learning about this, writing dissertations about this area and doing research in this area. So the sociology department began a research program that was intended to reach out across the entire university uh, community to start to build a network of researchers in this area. And that's been hugely successful, a huge take up, everything from physics and math to history, classics, sociology, modern languages, departments across the university have joined up around uh, research themes, methodological themes, analytical themes, lots of different themes that are the subject of our program. Um, but importantly, we did also decide to do a bit of research about Cambridge, about the Cambridge community, uh, partly motivated by the Stonewall report that showed the very large numbers of students who don't disclose their sexual or gender identities um, at British universities up to 80% in some cases, which was quite shocking. So we did a, a, a study, a small qualitative study of staff, students, academic staff and assistant staff at Cambridge. And we published it last year. It's called Out at Cambridge. Um, you can download an e-copy of the report if you'd like to read it. Um, and we, we found pretty much what you'd expect. We found that a lot of people at Cambridge feel very welcomed, they feel very encouraged, they feel very supported, but there is a significant number of people who don't feel as welcome, who don't feel as comfortable, and who don't necessarily feel that they can participate in the Cambridge community as much as they would like. So um, this report has helped us to link up the research part of our program with um, other kinds of activities at Cambridge, including the staff network. And we were absolutely thrilled last year when um, members of the Cambridge alumni group started a new LGBTQ plus alumni association network, um, which is now formally part of the Cambridge alumni infrastructure. Um, so, I'd like to turn now to Stephen Friel, one of the um, founders of the new LGBTQ plus staff network. So he can tell you a bit about that. He's a um, graduate of Jesus class of 1996, a uh, lawyer in London. And I will be very happy to come back at the end and answer more questions about the program. Um, but for now, I wanna turn it over to Stephen to talk about the new alumni network in this area. Great, thank you, Sarah. Uh, as Sarah said, my name is Stephen Freel. I'm a Jesus graduate. I studied at Jesus 96 to 99. And uh, 20 years later, after graduating in uh, 2019, I co-founded uh, with my friends, uh, Emma Wolcott and Matthew Maddox, uh, the uh, Cambridge LBGT Plus Alumni Association. Um, the, the, the genesis of where I came from was as simple as I received an invitation to a BEAM alumni event uh, and uh, I emailed the organizers and I said, oh, well, as it happens, I, I can't make that uh, event, but do you know what the LBGT equivalent is or how I get in touch with the LBGT alumni organization? And a few emails later, I worked out that there was none, so it was time for it to come, come into an existence. 
Um, uh, and that was last year. And, and since then, there has been a significant uh, take up by the alumni community uh, and the uh, organization is very much up and running. We do a number of things. I think first and foremost, it's a social network. Uh, it's an opportunity for uh, alumni, uh, current students, academic staff, uh, and anyone else affiliated with the university and with an interest in LBGT uh, issues uh, to, to get together and, and to have a, a, a social outlet. Um, uh, at the end of last year and at the start of this year, that social outlet was face-to-face. -face. Uh, we had a fantastic launch dinner at Pembroke, uh, hosted by Lord Chris Smith, the master of Pembroke, and one of our more uh, famous L recent LBGT alumni. Uh, and uh, at the start of this year, we had an event uh, at Trinity Hall, uh, hosted by Sarah to discuss the Q, Q Plus report. Um, since uh, lockdown, it's, uh, it's time to move online. We've got a vibrant online presence, uh, primarily on LinkedIn, uh, and there are a few hundred uh, members of the LinkedIn community. Um, and uh, I think this particular event uh, has been uh, uh, an incentive for us to do more online activity uh, through the end of this year and the start of next year. And so some of that's in the pipe pipeline. Uh, in addition to uh, a network, we're also a point of contact for LBGT alumni at the university. So for example, when the University Alumni Magazine wanted to speak to alumni about what LBGT History Month meant to them, they had someone to contact to get through to the alumni, and so we're a point of contact in that respect. Um, and, and to a little extent, we're involved in advocacy. So for example, when some of the current LBGT students want to encourage some of the um, colleges that hadn't yet flown a rainbow flag uh, in, in honor of LBGT History Month, uh, we used our alumni voice to get in touch with the colleges and to lend our support for that initiative. Um, we're also here to, I suppose, in a, to the extent that we can help make things better for the current students and the future students um, uh, to help the university, the colleges, the administration understand that uh, LBGT students um, have particular interests, particular requirements, and to, to make sure that they're seen uh, in that context. And then finally, I suppose, like any alumni organization, we're about uh, refreshing our contact with the academic community from which we came and to which we're, we're strongly affiliated. But I suppose in addition to refreshing uh, the alumni relationship with the university, there's also an element of repairing the um, relationship with the university, perhaps more so than some other alumni groups. Some of our uh, constituents have um, not entirely positive stories about their time because of their LBGT status. Um, they're proud and, and they're glad to be associated with the university and they largely feel incredibly positive about that relationship. But there's one small aspect of it, perhaps the LBGT side of their character and personality and how that wasn't best served during their time at Cambridge, that they, they want an opportunity to, to repair uh, and, and, and to have a bit of closure on that, and we offer that as well. Um, so it's, it's fantastic that the um, creation of the LBGT uh, uh, Alumni Association coincided with so much activity at the university through uh, Professor Franklin's uh, studies and research and initiatives, uh, through uh, other students uh, getting together at, at um, uh, KUSU and elsewhere. Uh, and generally, there's, there seems to be a pleasing momentum towards uh, recognizing and celebrating the LG, LGBT input and participation at the university, and we're proud to be a part of that. Um, and so if anyone here listening or joining today wants to know more, please don't hesitate to get in touch with me, and we'll be delighted to have you on board. Okay, with that said, uh, I'd now like to hand on to the next uh, presenter, uh, and that will be Hakan Sandal Wilson. Uh, Hakan is a current PhD student uh, researching and working in the LBGTQ plus space. Hakan. Thank you so much. Um, hello, everyone. 
I'm honored to be speaking at this event, which I hope will play a role creating a just and equal environment for all within the university and after the university. Um, during my time at Cambridge, I can say three things in particular made me happy as an openly gay researcher. Firstly, witnessing and participating in student activism for LGBT plus equality within the university. I served as black and minority ethnic representative for Cambridge University Student Union LGBT plus, where I saw how change happens through students' transformative persistence. Secondly, the founding of LGBTQ plus at Chem, which addressed what I think was really missing in the university for developing and understanding issues relating to LGBT plus and queer studies, which are not at all disconnected from the real world and our real struggles, as the Out at Chem report shows. And finally, and in all honesty, the launch of the new LGBTQ plus alumni network, which I'm looking forward to be becoming a part of as soon as I submit my dissertation and pass my viva. Today, I will focus on the out at, uh, out at Cambridge report and try to highlight its importance from my own perspective. I would like to touch upon three themes I identified regarding the report. Respectively, these are about the academic importance of the report, the question of intersectionality, and a just future I would like to imagine. I will start with the academic importance of the report. Firstly, 55 semi-structured face-to-face interviews uh, with rigorous analysis is a tremendous achievement in terms of methodology. It does not claim to be representative, but what it does do is to open up a space for the feelings and lived experiences of LGBT plus students and staff to be heard. If face-to-face -face interviews are conducted well by a competent researcher and analyzed justly, even the silences and gaps speak loudly. In my opinion, Elizabeth Sandler, Dr. Martin Smitana and Dr. Robert Prelat have proved to be leading scholars in that sense by making this report possible and indeed groundbreaking. Another important aspect of the report is that it initiated and will continue to initiate public conversation, which will have transformative effects in the long run. Um, and just look at what is happening today as an example. Uh, we are gathered together online discussing the various aspects of disclosure at the University of Cambridge through our own diverse different backgrounds and histories. This is in and of itself so valuable. And then we have the question of intersectionality. Historically speaking, the University of Cambridge, being one of the most prestigious universities in the world, has not been the most welcoming environment for some of us. We should highlight that this is not confined to non-normative sexualities. This university has a record of multiple discriminations against women, against the working class, against black and minority ethnic communities, against migrants, and against LGBT plus people. And these categories are not necessarily exclusive of each other. Just think of a black trans woman coming from a working class background, or a Syrian gay man having to leave his country because of the war. This is where intersectionality comes at play. Our oppressed intersecting identities matter. Obviously, our university has changed a lot, but this did not happen at all by a twist of fate or people waking up one day saying, okay, we must be more inclusive and fair. It happened thanks to courageous people at this university and elsewhere who openly engaged with the politics of justice and equality. It happened because the students and the staff of this university spoke up. It happened because people who knew it mattered did not stay silent. It happened because students of this university ensured that colleges fly the rainbow flag. This report, I wholeheartedly believe, is one of the cornerstones of this history of belief in equality and justice at this university. Consequently, thanks to LGBTQ plus at CAM, we now have the chance to institutionalize these efforts for LGBT plus people of different backgrounds. Let's not forget, as the report observes and recommends for future research, further emphasis on the experiences of underrepresented groups is needed. A staff member in the report, for example, says, quote, sometimes people just don't realize how straight and white and male our society is depicted, end quote. This is absolutely true. A recent Stonewall report reveals that 51% of black and minority ethnic LGBT people face discrimination from within the LGBT community. And this has to change. We are in the struggle for equality together. And in order to be strong in our struggle, we have to acknowledge our differences within LGBT plus communities and work towards a true equality that we want to see in the world. 
So in the conversations that the Alt at Chem report initiates, the University of Cambridge, LGBTQ plus at Chem, and all of us have a responsibility to challenge homophobia, transphobia, xenophobia, and racism simultaneously. I don't want to take up much more time. Um, one of my favorite autobiographies that I feel empowered after reading is uh, Zami, a new spelling of my name by the black lesbian feminist Audre Lorde. Lorde says in her autobiography that, quote, any world which did not have a place for me loving women was not a world in which I wanted to live, nor one which I could fight for, end quote. This citation is very dear to my heart and my scholarly work and my activism. Change doesn't come on a silver plate. We have to work to make it happen, and we have to do it together. We have to fight for a world in which we can imagine ourselves and our friends and families safe, happy, and peaceful. The Art at Chem report, LGBTQ plus at Chem, student activism at our university, and the alumni network help me think of such a world and give me the will to continue. Thank you so much for listening to me, and now I'm, uh, let me introduce our next speaker. Uh, Dr. Miriam Lin, uh, she, her pronouns, is an equality and diversity consultant at the University of Cambridge and co-chairs the Gender Identity and Sexual Orientation Committee. Thank you so much, Hakan, and thank you everybody um, for joining this webinar. It's an absolute pleasure and honour to be here on such a fine day and during this brilliant festival. So I've worked for the university for four years. Um, prior to me working at the university, I remember being um, an audience member at the university's LGBT um, History Month lecture in February. I can't exactly remember when it was, but it was Sandy Toxvig um, giving a real passionate account of um, why she was, um, well, why she was there and her, her experiences at Girton. Not, I mean, she's not that much older than I am, but ones that were not, not she wasn't proud of, and she wasn't proud of the way that she had faced, in her own words, discrimination from um, from the college during her time here at Cambridge, and that she had been approached by the college to to work on kind of alumni relations with the college, but actually she was waiting for an apology um, from Girton College in order for her to recognise that things had moved on for her and that she could become an active member again as an alumni of the Collegiate Cambridge um, situation. Now today I am absolutely delighted to say that we are in conversation with Sandy to come and deliver the next, um, well hopefully it won't be a virtual uh, LGBT history month so it's probably not going to be 2021 but in some time soon um, Sandy will come back and will be will be delivering the talk, the lecture for us here at the institution. And that tells me a couple of things. One is that things have changed, that she is in absolute good communication with Girton College today and the administration that's there. And the fact is that she is actually willing and wanting to see change and to inspire people today and work within community. So this is, this is really inspirational for me to recognize that actually there is something very, very powerful about the visibility of, um, of people, whoever they are, to be able to speak, talk, work with colleges as they are now and to recognise that things haven't been perfect and that we have had some way to go in terms of, and we still have a way to go in terms of this institution, all of the colleges being the safest possible place that people can be who they are regardless of their gender identity or regardless of their sexual orientation. And that's really, really important for me because as a 50-year-old middle-class reasonably well-educated woman, I feel that, you know, that actually I'm, I'm very happy to be openly out as a lesbian within this institution. And I feel that that's, in, in a way, I'm in a privileged position to be able to do that. However, what we are absolutely, um, what we know throughout the work that we've done um, as a university equality and diversity section, but in our, in conversations with colleagues, um, is and with students and with other staff members is is the fact that actually if you are yourself concerned and you are you are fearful that you won't get accepted, then even by by the fact that you don't know and that it's not it's not clear to you how you will be or not accepted that actually silence silence isn't good enough. So this is why one of the key things that we do as an E and D section is we've raised the game in terms of looking at visible ways of actually 
signaling and coding the fact that that we believe that this institution should be and how we can make it the safest space so visible markers of of that this is a place where we can have conversations but also that you are safe to be who you are so we have been really key in making sure that every year that there is a strong lgbt history month lecture that we have a staff network that is is listens to people advocates on behalf of people and so that it's as easy for um it's as easy for a porter or an administrator within the institution or a gardener to be out and truly who they are as much as it is for a, a fellow or an academic um within the institution. So that's a really key feature for me. And I think that touches on intersectionality that Hakam mentioned too, is who is it easy for to be out and how do we signal to people that it's safe to be out? So we have rainbow lanyards. We engage very heavily in terms of uh, ensuring that there are rainbow flags in visible places across the institution. And I'm really proud that we, um, as an institution, flew the rainbow flag above the old schools, the heart of the administrative centre of the institution for the first time ever um, within the university this last year. The other thing that I'm really proud of is that we have we have connections within the local community as well as within the wider community. And the fact is that the VC was the was the first person to uh, to address the crowd at the first ever Cambridge Pride last year as well. So really signalling that actually from the very the highest level of within the institution that the message is actually this is something that we want to have on the agenda that we need to be visible about otherwise people just simply may not know and um, and whilst people people working with institutions may think well you know things have changed um you know the world's a much op more open place but actually unless we talk about these things unless we actually give signal to it and visibility that uh, that we're doing a disservice so that's that's our role. We have a very active um, staff network. Um, I think we're about 300 staff members at the moment, active in terms of social networking. We also have talks, um, informal talks. We've been very active in terms of trying to offer during this COVID period of time that we have a virtual presence where people feel that they can connect. Um, so that's that's the real kind of strength of where we're at um, as a staff END section so i think um that covers that covers our work in terms of e and d section working very closely wanting better relationships i guess with with the student societies whilst also recognizing and valuing the fact that their student activism may um take a, a separate uh, different role but always wanting to kind of communicate um with them so that we can we can be supportive where we can without being too bureaucratic um, in our in our ways of working. So I hope that gives a flavour of the work that the small but perfectly formed e and section at the institution uh, is, is working. So I'd like to now hand, hand over to Sarah, I do believe. Thank you. Okay. I'm back and unmuted. Um, thank you everyone for those really terrific presentations. And I hope all of you participating in this webinar can say um, that there is indeed a lot happening in this space. And furthermore, that there's a huge amount of energy behind these changes at Cambridge. Um, so we are very ambitious in terms of what we're trying to do. And of course, you know, what we're trying to do is quite difficult um, to 800 year old institution, these issues have not historically been playing a significant role in how Cambridge represents itself to the wider society, and they haven't even been as visible within Cambridge as they might have been, um, which is in some ways quite surprising um, when we look at the um, incredibly prominent role of LGBTQ alumni from Cambridge, including people like Sandy Tuxvig, it's a long list really, not just people in the entertainment industry, but people working in all sectors of society um, who are part of a very distinctive community that has remained in some ways kind of surprisingly muted in Cambridge's history. So, so yeah, so we have some questions coming in, which is great. Um, and what I'll do is I'll just try and take questions off the questions that are coming in. I'll pass them on to our panel and I might even um, combine some of them, and I'm actually going to start with the question that one of you 
has asked, which is how can Cambridge change its public appearance of being white, straight, and male? Um, how can cha Cambridge change, change its appearance? And I wonder, do any of you on the panel want to um, raise your hand if you want to address that question? Well, Sarah, I'll, I'll, I'll jump in. I, I, I think that um, Cambridge is already starting to realize that its appearance is exclusively um, uh, private educated white um, uh, and with a healthy dollop of sexism uh, in there, uh, it's already starting to tackle that. And one of the ways it's doing that is by high visibility leadership. Um, uh, at uh, Jesus, I was very proud to see Sunita Allen become the master of our college, the, uh, I think the first woman and the first person of color at Jesus in its 500 year history. Um, and that type of visible leadership is, is important um, around the world. Uh, also, I think the curriculum, um, they need to continue, the, the academics need to continue looking at the curriculum. It was 25 years ago that I studied law there, uh, but even the study of law was entirely heterosexual from its perspective. Um, I don't ever remember it being challenged in property law or family law, but the perspective from which these issues came from were entirely heterosexual. Um, and it certainly didn't reflect to the family or the property issues that I went on to have when I left the university. So those are two key things I think the university is beginning to do and could continue to do. Yeah. Miriam, do you want to add something? Yes, I do. Um, given that uh, I think, yeah, I was going to say in an ideal world, I wouldn't have a role because there, it wouldn't, there wouldn't be needed, you know, there wouldn't be any ND section that's needed, but actually, as we probably all are far too aware of that, um, as an institution, we have a long, we have a long way to go with, I think, a very short time scale in which to have confidence, uh, you know, have the public's confidence, have our students and our staff confidence in making real changes. However, we are shifting and, and this isn't a kind of a bureaucrat's kind of um, statement on this, but you know, when we first started working with the um, gender equality charter, the Athena Swan charter, we had 14% of our professors our professors were were women. Um, we are now up to 22%. That's woefully low still. And and given I've been in meetings and said, okay, so our target is 50%, or, you know, or or thereabout. And people, you know, the the attitude is still one of are you, you know, are you, are you serious? And it's like, yes, we, we are serious because, because otherwise what we're talking about is, is a completely, you know, an unequal, an unequal system. I believe that, um, and we are starting to do this work in terms of our commitment and our race equality work is the fact um, that we actually need to relook at everything that we're doing in through a different equality lens, that we actually look at what do we mean by merit? And this is the, the question that I think we all need Need to to be who are involved in admissions, in, involved in recruitment, in, involved in progression and promotion of staff um, within the institution, and what opportunities we're offering is are uh, how are we looking? How are we looking? How are we able to give give a real kind of a viewpoint that this is this is a this is a structure, this is a system that isn't that isn't biased in any shape or form because. If we have, you know, if the LGBT network has been around for 12 years, as I said, but, you know, the, the first women woman professor, I don't know if Sarah knows that, that detail off the top of the head, but anyway, it's within my lifetime, I do believe. But, you know, we have 800 years of bias that we're, that we're working against. And actually, that's, that's a structural issue that we need to have answers in place. We need to look at, as I said, we, we need to look at all of our recruitment processes. And we need to be able to really neatly look at analysing that data, putting interventions in place, but actually keeping ourselves in check. And I think one of the other questions is around how are we doing in comparison to other institutions? And it is, it's a case of actually we do, we do need to rigorously look at who do we give leadership opportunities to. You know, we, we, we pay and we support development opportunities for, for, gender, for, for gender equality um, within the institution, but we don't do the same for um, black, Asian, minority, ethnic leadership courses or for LGBT specific leadership courses. So there are real instances here of, of what we what we're supporting, what resource are we putting um, against this. And and also we need to be really mindful of the fact that if we're um if we're looking at visibility that we don't keep asking the same women or the same black 
um, academics to do the emotional work and labour for us as an institution. So it's we've got we've got there are no quick wins here, but that's no reason not to do not to do the work. So it is it is around structurally looking how how does it really feel to belong at this institution? And anytime somebody says to me about recruiting, well, will they fit in? It's a case of actually, no, that's the wrong question. Do you know what I mean that's the wrong question to ask? It's a case of how does the institution need to change in order to make make this um, an accessible place um, for people? And it will mean, and I do, it will mean that some toppling of power in a way. I mean, this is this might not necessarily be a cosy process, but it is one that I I believe. Um, and I hope um, I hope you agree with me. People who've had contact with the VC um, believe that this is you know this is a moment in time that we need to we need to grasp. Yeah, thank you so much for those answers. And Hakan, I wanted to say how much I appreciated what you said about there being a sense of momentum and change, whilst at the same time you also pointed out how huge the obstacles are to those changes. I wondered, could you just say a bit, how fun about what we might, one of the couple of the questions are about what we need to do to make university more inclusive, and maybe we can actually specify that by saying, are there things we need to do this year, now that we're online, now that we, now that we can create a different kind of table to be at, to discuss things, are there things we need to do this year to make Cambridge really stand out as a place that's committed to these issues? Yeah, that, that's a really important question. And I want to add, totally agreeing with Stephen and Miriam, that pub, the, the public appearance of the university will change um, as the university itself changes. So we need to strengthen our communities within the university in order uh, to, to make those transformations possible. And I think one of the questions that you just asked uh, coming from the audience is very important. What advice would you give to new students who are worried about coming out? It is a very difficult and complicated question because everyone comes from a different background. So you can't, it is very difficult to give a straightforward answer. But what I can say, for example, referring to the report that I uh, talked about, uh, there's a really important um, comment coming from a postgraduate student. This would give a sense of what we need to do. Uh, I'm reading the comment by the student. LGBTQ plus at CAM has been really helpful. Just the fact that this initiative exists, that there are events happening and that LGBTQ plus is in some ways a focus of the university has helped me to feel more comfortable to disclose myself. I think this is really important and it gives um, some clues for us to, to, to do uh, in the coming year as well. And I think as LGBTQ plus at CAM, the alumni network, we need to be more active and uh, cognizant of the different histories of the students so that uh, we can become, become more welcoming and open up spaces for people to come and speak up for themselves rather than us imposing or, or telling what to do. Yeah, we have a lot of questions here about, you know, how can we make the change happen? And I think probably one of the most important answers to those questions is what, what, we, can't, what we can't do to make the change happen, which is to just try and pretend the change is happening by itself. We have to build the change up from a grassroots level. And that includes from the kind of teaching we do, from the kind of curriculum we offer, from the kind of research we have, and what kind of communities are created in departments and colleges. Um, and I just want to mention to people who are watching that sometimes big changes can start from relatively small um, beginnings and we do now have these um, Cambridge um, University rainbow lanyards with the Cambridge crest on them and they've become wildly popular and you can't come to Cambridge anymore although nobody can really come to Cambridge very easily right now but if you were walking around Cambridge right now you would see loads of people wearing the rainbow lanyard which is such a wonderful flag and sign of change but it's not a superficial sign of change it's a real sign of how much people want things to change. Um, Okay, so yes, there's questions. How can we work to make the university more inclusive place? What kinds of actions would you suggest we as individuals can take? Um, we've, we've looked at the question, what advice would you give to new students? 
Um, and how does Cambridge currently compare to other institutions? We've, we've answered that as well. I think the answer to these questions is that we have to make actions that are genuinely meaningful in our workplaces and we can't just sign up to get the gold award for diversity. You know, it has to be a very real change. We also have a very important question here about trans rights and about trans people. Um, and this is an uh, issue that we um, discussed in the report. And we are also preparing a teaching pack about teaching trans in classrooms. One of the most important principles for teaching trans in classrooms that we've identified is that it's very important for trans voices to be in the room when teaching is being done about trans issues. Unfortunately, that's quite easy now that we can use online resources, we can use online interviews, we can use YouTube even before the pandemic, we were able to use online resources in the classroom to make sure the trans voices are absolutely at the heart of the teaching we do about trans lives and why trans lives matter. Um, we had a major conference at Cambridge last year, Beyond Binary, that featured one of the key scholars in the trans area, Susan Stryker, um, who, whose work is available um, on our website as well. So yeah, so that's a very important part of our work as are the intersectional issues that, that Hakan mentioned about the ways in which LGBTQ identities intersect with other kinds of identities. And, and that too is an area where students are very keen to do their own research, um, which is another of the things we do. Okay, so um, let's see in terms of other questions. Here's one um, I think we can all um, think a bit about what would we like to see the institution tackle next? <laughs> Anybody want to make a comment on that one? Um, possibly the answer to that is that they are already very interwoven, all of these issues, the idea that they're separate is possibly one of the things we're trying to overcome. Um, and um, yeah, Miriam, go ahead. I was I was just thinking actually um, in terms of it is it is attitudinal change as well as structural change and these kind of things happen you know hand in hand and I think it's it's a, you know piece of work that's taken it feels like forever is to actually ensure um, you know that we have smooth ways in which we can we can um, that trans people can. Trans transition smoothly you know the, the processes and the administration is actually quite smooth within the institution and we know that that's not as good as we would like um, and that's probably the you know the administration of the entire institution but however in saying that I think it's really important that we get these that we get these HR systems right otherwise it feels like um, it feels like a you know, doubly discriminatory when when things don't happen smoothly, and you know, there's a recent there's a recent uh, higher education statistical analysis uh, request going forward that that gender identity and asking around uh, gender identity assigned at birth whether that's that's the same as your gender identity now. But that's in a way we've we haven't got that right as an institution now because we haven't got the attitude right about asking those questions. It's it seems to be asked in a really blunt kind of way as if that this you know as if you know that that information should be freely um freely given up whereas we know that you know that that's incredibly sensitive information and and that that will trigger many questions for people that kind of those people at the kind of the administrative statistical end are not necessarily tuned into so what i'd like to tackle is actually really kind of understanding heteronormativity you know, in a way that actually changes people's attitudes, so that that we can that we can kind of debunk that from the process side um, as well as the attitudinal side throughout. So that we've just opened, you know, we've just opened our hearts and minds with, without, you know, seeing that the the box is to be ticked for the sake of ticking boxes, but that actually that that we've changed that in a way that is also really, you know, interesting and fascinating because we won't. We won't shift. We won't shift. Kind of research and teaching um, to, to kind of be truly inclusive and intersectional until that's seen as a, as another kind of cross cut. You know, cutting. You know, as something that's actually that adds value. And I think we're we're not quite there either. And I think that's that's another. You know, it seems I'd quite like it that we shift it from. You know, this is a case of 
completing charter awards to actually this is actually enhances this enhances our this is enhances our teaching and this enhances our our research and without it we will become dinosaurs this is in my personal my personal view and and um you know we can't people won't people will think why why would i come and study here or why would i come and come and work here if if you know it's as it's as white and, and stale as, as as it's perceived and is so um Stephen, can i just come back to you for a minute too because um this is an area where the university of cambridge can work together with the alumni association we have research tools we have expertise we have teaching um capacity at cambridge how do you think that you alumni network the new lgbtq alumni network can work with Cambridge to help, as it were, you know, radiate these changes more widely in society. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think uh, like a lot of alumni organizations, uh, we can be a conduit to the outside world. Uh, we can help uh, uh, bridge the ivory towers to, to, to London, to the wider world, to, to parts of the world where LBGT rights are far behind where they should be. Um, uh, and we can create that conduit, uh, like, like we were, we're already doing when we had the discussion of the Q plus report and we were able to feedback from the alumni world and from the real world on that academic study. I, I, I think so too, Sarah, as you and I have discussed, I think um, some of the London universities in particular are very good at um, continuing education uh, for alumni, but for the wider community, on issues that the university is leading on its research, be that science, technology, uh, but also LBGT. Uh, I think that, that uh, employers uh, would be very open to hearing uh, from the university on uh, the LBGT research the university is doing and how that might influence employment practices. Uh, I think that uh, business might like to hear how diversity helps um, from an economic as well as from a social perspective. Um, I, I think that that's what the alumni group does. It, it creates that bridge between the university and the outside world. Yeah, yeah. I, I would maybe like to add to that too, just one point, um, which is that, um, you know, we, we've really tried to do research about our own institution at Cambridge. We've tried to listen and to learn using the research tools we have what people actually think and say. And that's been a very, very important exercise because learning to listen in order to hear what you need to hear is not at all a straightforward process. And I, I personally would be very pleased to hear from alumni who um, will maybe read the report. You can download it online at the Q plus website at Cambridge, LGBTQ plus website. I would be very interested to hear from alumni about what I would call data-driven aspects of social change and institutional change. It's all very well to say we want this or we want that, but we need to have some investigation into the obstacles of change if we're actually gonna overcome them successfully. So I, I would really welcome any feedback that uh, alumni have about their own workplaces, about their own efforts to bring about institutional change. It's a very difficult process to do that. It's by no means just a question of changing even your appearance or your you know, code of conduct, whatever, you, you really have to learn in depth what are the obstacles at your own institution and then you have to get people on board in order to change them. Hakan, did you want to add something? I think, yeah, it's very important to, to, to act together with the alumni network and the university so that we can, um, while transforming the university as an institution itself, we can reach um, to a wider group of people. So that, that's why I, I agree totally. Uh, and Sarah, if I might, I, the, one of the themes that comes out of some of the questions that I'm seeing coming through in the chat group in terms of uh, what can the individual do, including what advice might one might give to a student who, who wants to, to come out. Um, a common theme to my answer is uh, join together, we're stronger together, and that's one of the reasons the alumni group is, is in existence. Um, to the students, join the LBGT group at your college, at the university, 
group together with other people in a common situation um, have that uh, that common bond. Uh, and the same is true of the alumni group. Um, we're, we're going to be able to do more together. Uh, our voice will be amplified if we get together. Yeah, I agree. Well, we have one final question here that's just come in about what's your favorite event or policy that's happened over the last few years at the university? And I think that might make a very fitting way to close this session if we do a round robin about what's the favorite event or policy that's happened over the last few years at the university? That's quite a big question. Miriam, do you want to start us off? Well, I'm very excited. This is hot off the press. Is that uh, this is a new policy change? Is um, well, you may you may not be aware of this, but very little in this institution is mandated. Um, but we have, um, as of October the first, um, equality and diver- whatever you think of equality and diversity training. In fact, that's a, probably another topic for a webinar. But as of October the first, um, it will be mandated that all staff members are required to to take E and D online training, and for anybody involved in recruitment, that they take unconscious bias training as well. So I think for that to happen, um, and that took that took some doing, but I'm I'm very pleased and proud that actually then that you know that is a significant that's a significant policy change so um, people will will have to engage with that thank you Hakan do you want to um, share something with us <laughs> I'm, I'm, as, I, as I mentioned I'm very happy with LGBTQ plus at CAM it, it will make, uh, make a difference um, it is making a difference so I guess that is the highlight of my <laughs> uh, of what I have seen in the university in the recent years oh thank you very much and Stephen yeah, so, so um, one of the nice things about being a Cambridge graduate is going back up to Cambridge uh, for family occasions, including weddings. Uh, and I am delighted to have been to my first same-sex wedding at a Cambridge chapel. Um, and uh, it, was, it, it made me feel good. That's great. Well, I have to say that one of my absolute favourite events at Cambridge over the last few years, Hakan, was the Methodology Seminar Series that you ran um, in partnership with the Center for Gender Studies and CRASH, um, and for, for which you recently were, were awarded special recognition. Um, it's such an example of the difference it makes to integrate LGBTQ perspectives into the very heart of the research we do. So, um, okay, well, I wanna thank everyone for participating, especially all of you who've, who've uh, joined us online. It's all a bit different doing these things online, but we have to remember that it is in and of itself widening participation in some very, very important ways. Um, This is gonna be a year of reinvention ahead of us for the university and for society at large. Um, And again, LGBTQ will be very much at the heart of that process of reinvention because that's 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 really what we're all about. So thank you very much, everyone. Great, thank you, bye-bye. Thank you, everyone.